The tools of a surgeon's trade are of vital importance and can mean the difference between life and death. Every single thing that is handed to you needs to work. But what if it doesn't? This is an eye instrument. I just can't tell you how bad it is. We reveal the truth about where our surgical tools are made and expose the weaknesses in the systems in place to protect patients. Would I ever have to admit that it wasn't German steel? I cannot believe that anybody in the NHS knows that this is going on. Every year, more than 30 million operations are carried out in Britain's hospitals. If you have someone with a serious life-threatening condition or limb-threatening condition and you're fighting to save their limb or their life. As a surgeon with more than 20 years' experience, Paul Sroden understands better than most the need for surgical instruments to be fit for purpose. Those tools of your trade, they need to be just right. It's no good discovering that something doesn't work as it should do and having to hand it back and get another one. Any little bit of that process nudges that boundary towards delaying a person's recovery, resulting in an incomplete recovery, or even resulting in terrible consequences of limb loss or death. We all assume that surgical instruments are made to the highest of standards. But over the last year I've been investigating and the evidence I've uncovered suggests all isn't well in this industry. Two years ago, Dorothy Brown underwent heart surgery at Nottingham City Hospital. The operation was a success until she contracted an antibiotic resistant superbug. I knew I was dying and I knew, uh, I just knew I was dying. I couldn't go through all that and not know, nobody could. And all I remember thinking, oh, just let me go, just let me go, you know, I just had enough. Ten others operated on by the same surgeon also became seriously ill. In total, five of the 11 heart patients who became infected died. I've obtained a copy of the confidential report into what happened in Nottingham. The Trust's investigation found two of the most likely causes of the spread of infection to be airborne transmission or micropunctures in the surgeon's gloves. The Trust now insists all cardiac surgeons wear either thick gloves or two sets. According to experts, the most common cause of micropunctures is poorly made instruments. There are no official figures in the UK, but we've come across three cases where substandard instruments have been definitively linked to causing death or serious harm. In the US, the Federal Drug Administration records almost a thousand adverse incidents involving poor quality surgical instruments every year. I've contacted NHS surgeons who say substandard instruments have become all too common. Worried about possible repercussions, they refused on-camera interviews, but three agreed to us using their testimony. There is not an operating week which goes by when something doesn't go wrong. Rough edges on the instruments will slice through my hands. You struggle with an arterial clamp and you know this patient is bleeding longer than he should because your instrument isn't working. You look at your glove which has been torn by a rough edge of an instrument and you think, have I just cut that patient's bowel with this? There's one NHS worker so concerned about the poor quality of some surgical instruments, he's agreed to speak out. Tom, oh, hello. I'm Sam from the BBC, Sam. nice to meet you, I'm nice Tom to Brophy. put a face to the name. The lead, lead technologist Tom Brophy checks the instruments coming into the Barts and the London Trust. He's its last line of defence. Because so many of the surgical tools he sees are failing his tests, He's begun documenting the faults. This is an eye instrument used in ophthalmic surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, I don't know how they made it that bad, actually. For an eye instrument to have a trench. Well, that's not supposed to be there. No, 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 no. That should be flat. That's just a trench. There's a tunnel. And look at the burrs. Oh, that's, and that's and used for the, the eye? Look at the burrs all the way along. Oh, God. This is just so bad. Uh, I just can't tell you how bad it is. <laughs> 
used to grip the soft tissue of the eye during surgery, precision is crucial. Most of the defects Tom identifies are invisible without magnification. In surgery, they can be devastating. He regularly finds fractures and wells on instruments which can trap body tissue and blood, a serious infection risk. Other problems include sharp protruding guide pins on surgical forceps. These should be flush and, if not, can puncture a surgeon's glove. He also finds burrs or metal fragments which can break off inside the body. One example he shows me is a heart retractor designed to be used on infants. That was a 15 millimeter burr along the blade of the retractor along there. So that's uh, a 50 mm burr, which was like a needle. And if we hadn't actually stopped that, that could have been potentially used on a, a very young baby. Companies making instruments for the UK must be registered with an EU body. In Britain, that's the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRA. After an increase in complaints about possible problems, the MHRA issued a warning last December that care should be taken to ensure new instruments are fit for purpose. However, responsibility for quality currently rests with the suppliers and manufacturers. Tom Brophy rejects almost one in five of all surgical instruments supplied to his trust and says he's even been sent used equipment passed off as new. One instance, uh, there, there was blood still on, 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 the, on the actual uh, instruments. There was actually dry blood on about 11% of the order. So whatever happened, they've actually rerouted themselves back into uh, the sales market as brand new. I don't know how they get back in, but they have. There are more than 180 health trusts and boards in the UK. The same companies which supply BARTs can also supply other NHS and private hospitals. While most trusts and boards carry out some visual checks of instruments, BARTs is the only one to employ a technologist to inspect them to British standards. On more than one occasion, a supplier has, has rang me up and said, that instrument you rejected, I, I've passed it on to uh, another hospital and they accepted it. My answer to him was, of course they're going to accept it because they haven't checked it. And more worryingly, the instrument he, he spoke to me was actually corroding on the serrations and it was a cardiac instrument. Suppliers can be manufacturers or middlemen, major companies or one-man bands. There are more than 900 manufacturers registered with the MHRA to sell surgical instruments. The vast majority of those instruments aren't made here, but thousands of miles away. Remarkably, two-thirds of the world's surgical instruments are made in one city in Pakistan. 70% of the 916 manufacturers registered with the MHRA are based here. That city is Sialkot. And according to their manufacturers association, Sialkot produces 100 million surgical instruments a year. Pakistan has recently experienced an upsurge in terrorist violence and Sialkot's in the troubled northern Punjab area, close to the disputed border with India. The city's Chamber of Commerce has arranged for me to visit factories which make surgical instruments for British companies. The first factory I visit is a company called Hillbro. Outside, its chief executive, Mohammed Ashraf, is waiting for me. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Hello. Hello. Nice Hello. to meet you. Thank you very I much. I would give you a good show here. What, what are we about to see? It's so noisy. Yeah. This is the manufacturing process. Yeah, wow, my goodness. Inside, dozens of machines. The clatter of the lathes and the drills is deafening. Among the instruments they're making are surgical scissors. And these would be for the UK. So do you do, you do many contracts for the UK hospitals? No, 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 no,
The instruments made here can pass through several suppliers before reaching UK hospitals. Over three levels and sitting in 26 acres of land, this factory is one of the biggest in Sialkot. I'm taken upstairs to the quality control room, where every instrument is checked and inspected with a magnifying glass. What's this man stamping on here? Can I see? It's very clever. Some of the instruments are stamped with the names of British companies. See you, Suwet Thakri. Suwet Thakri, that is an English company. Yeah, yeah. And what, what is this for? This is a retractor opening the wound. The company, Seawood Thackeray, describes itself as a leading supplier to hospitals in the UK, including the NHS. Can I have one of those to take? Because it's in English and it's British. As his staff get me a sample, Mr Ashraf has a surprising request. Don't tell people this is coming from Pakistan. You don't want people to know this is from Pakistan? You just tell them um, to go about it in England. We, we would have to say they're from England. Yeah. It's a request I would hear more than once in Sialkot. I'll find out why later. Thank you very much. Have a nice day in Seattle. I will. Thank you, Shakriya. We will come back again. We will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Sam. The Chamber of Commerce also arranged for me to see QSA Surgical, another of Sialkot's factories. Again, it was busy, clean, and well organized. Well, that, I think, was the public face that the Chamber of Commerce wanted us to see. Uh, professional, spotless, uh, a good advert for the surgical instruments industry. Whether it's the true face, I'm not so sure. A foggy dawn. And overnight I've had a call about one of Sialkot's smaller factories. A local translator comes with me to Regal Medical Instruments, which does business with two small UK-based suppliers. Inside, the conditions are a far cry from the Chamber of Commerce tours. Poor lighting makes it difficult to see, and the thick dust makes it hard to breathe. Yet here in the darkness, surgical instruments are being made. Upstairs is where instruments are checked before being stamped and packed for shipping. This is where it's decided if the surgical instrument is safe to be used by a surgeon somewhere in the world. If it passes inspection, it's given a quality stamp, the CE mark, which the MHRA say provides the necessary reassurance that the device is safe and fit for purpose. Unlike the other factories I've seen, there appear to be no magnifying glasses. What checks we see being carried out are made with the naked eye. So this is the quality control stamp or the company? Yes. Can I have a go? Can I try? Okay. Right, what do I do? You've checked that one. Did you check? No, I have to. Do I have to check it first for quality? I'm allowed to stamp the CE guarantee onto forceps used to grasp body tissue during an operation. I could get a job now as a quality control assessor. Oh, my first quality control. The checks had seemed far from rigorous. I'll be taking some samples from my trip back for Tom Brophy to test. We contacted the two UK-based companies Regal Medical trades with. One said they've never bought products from Regal, but do occasionally sell component parts to them. The other Vision Instruments in Bedford confirmed they do buy instruments from Regal, but not those used in eye surgery, because Regal are not capable of making these instruments to an adequate standard. Vision say they buy a small number of tubing clamp forceps from Regal, to sell on in the UK after Vision have made adjustments, checked and cleaned them.
Regal Medical say they always focus on quality and provide to our customers according to their demand. In Sialkot, I stumble upon a more ramshackle side to the industry. Workshop after workshop involved in making surgical instruments. I speak to an industry contact who tells me the larger factories often farm out work to these makeshift units to meet orders. It's called outsourcing. One in ten of the 100 million instruments made in Sialkot each year are sold to the UK. Only Germany and the US buy more. Workers here earn around two pounds a day. Yet each tool they make can be sold on to UK hospitals for ten times that amount. Travelling deeper into the narrow streets, the conditions only get worse. Open sewers at the doorways often make filming difficult. It's packed with workers making arterial clamps and surgical scissors. There are more than 3,000 outsourcing units in Sialkot. Many of the larger companies don't like to admit to outsourcing. But two of these units tell me that Hilbro and Regal Medical, both factories we filmed earlier, use them. When you speak to Hilbro and say, do you outsource, they're quite cagey about it. But uh, this is one of them now. So we'll go and see what they do. So this is one of the outsourcing units for Hilbro. And is this the only outsourcing unit for Hilbro? There are many, many. Hilbro confirmed they do use outsourcing units, although didn't specify which ones. <laughs> All around me, different kinds of surgical forceps are being made. The instruments produced here could find their way to an operating theater near you. Yet if they did, would the NHS have any idea where or how they're made? Do you know which country all these are going to? Do you know which country this contract is for? This one, one in your hand is going to Russia. That's for Russia? This is for Japan. Japan. Germany. Germany. Have you got any for the UK at the moment? England. That's for England. They're dissecting forceps used for grasping soft body tissue during surgery. So, made in Pakistan and, I'm told, bound for the UK. The maker's mark, however, tells a different story. Made in Germany. Made in Germany. Made in Germany. It will be stamped made in Germany. Made in Germany. And it will be stamped here in Pakistan. Pakistan. Made in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Under EU laws, the instruments made in these back streets can be stamped with another country's name, so long as that country helped substantially transform the product. So, as the forged steel they're working with here comes from Germany, the whole thing can be stamped made in Germany and German instruments sell for much more than those stamped made in Pakistan. That earlier request from the boss at the Hilbro factory not to tell anyone his instruments are made here now makes sense. Neither the NHS nor the MHRA requires suppliers to inspect manufacturers. None of the individuals we spoke to in Pakistan could remember the last time any British supplier made an inspection visit. Seward Thackeray, who buy from Hilbro, say they last inspected them in 2006. Seward Thackeray told us Hilbro holds all necessary qualifications to meet the required manufacturing and quality standards, and added, we also carry out regular quality inspections on goods received prior to release into stock. 
There's no doubt that making inspection trips here is difficult. We've already changed hotels after a bomb threat. Working here is dangerous. But without inspections, can patient safety be properly protected? <laughs> Over the last two weeks, we've seen more than a hundred workshops. Under Pakistani law, children aged between 8 and 14 can work up to five hours a day. The local Chamber of Commerce assured me illegal child labor doesn't exist in this industry. However, we have seen a few children working. One in particular was clearly very young indeed, though we couldn't verify his age or his hours. A British Medical Association report estimates that up to 5,000 children here are employed making surgical instruments. I want to question the trade body here regarding what I've seen. I start by asking about child labor. Do you accept that you have problems within this industry that I've described? Child labor, yes. We have engaged ourselves uh, into rehabilitation of child labor program. We are actually trying very hard, but I will not deny the fact if he has to choose between sleeping hungry or working, a child worker, maybe he'll work a little bit. And what about the instruments? I show him a photograph of dissecting forceps made in Pakistan, which Tom Brophy had failed. You happy with that? It's made in Sialkot. It's very common. I don't know what is that. Can I have a yeah. closer look? This is a guide pin that should be flat. These puncture the surgeon's gloves. Well, this is a sliver. This is wrong. I, I agree with you. If you operated on somebody with that and that was left behind, it can kill them. Ma'am, uh, number one, this we never export such instruments. That's what you are showing was me. Was sent to, from this will go in into our a reaction. hospital trust in the UK. So that that might have been done by some unscrupulous uh, manufacturers. The people here are doing the best they can often in difficult conditions. With only one NHS trust checking new tools to British standards, it seems highly likely that poor quality instruments are getting into the system. Back in the UK, I wanted to interview the industry regulator, the MHRA, about what we'd seen. No one was available. But in a statement, they told us they have no evidence that non-compliant instruments are being supplied to the NHS. I show my footage to a man who's advised the government on patient safety and who investigates serious adverse incidents in hospitals to see how they can be avoided in the future. My God, I find it almost well, almost unbelievable. Surgeons are taking uh, instruments which they believe to be of a high quality and then and they're using them on their patients believing that they're doing the best that they can for their patients when really they've been made under these conditions. Procurement officers, if they knew that this was happening in Pakistan and those, those uh, surgical instruments were coming from that room into their hospital, they would, I would think, faint at the thought of it. I cannot believe that anybody in the NHS knows this is going on. At London's Barts Hospital, Tom Brophy has tested my instruments. I'd asked for samples from the factories we visited, and in total was given 19 instruments. 12 have failed. However, the Seaward Thackeray soft tissue retractor I got from Hillbro passed with flying colours. Of those that failed, problems include faulty screw heads, sharp protruding guide pins, soldering faults, pitted metal, and burrs. Tom Brophy says rigorous inspections have deterred some suppliers from selling to his trust altogether. Of course, they can still sell to the private sector and more than 180 other NHS trusts and boards. I hear a lot of companies that talk about quality. They come in and say patient quality is really important to us. But when you reject their equipment, quite quickly the mask drops and it's not about quality, it's about money. Remember Regal Medical, where I stamped surgical forceps with the CE mark? They told me they didn't have a company in the UK, but I found a Regal Medical in London 
which shares the same Pakistani fax number and website. Posing as a supplier wanting to buy instruments to sell on to the NHS, I arrange a meeting with a Mr. Nabil Amir and his business associate Shabazz Hussein, who claims to be the son of the factory owner back in Pakistan. Do you already supply to the NHS um, in the UK? In the UK, we, we got like generic suppliers to supply to the NHS actually. Oh, I see. Have you got samples with you? Anything? Have you got? Mr. Hussein then tells me there are three different grades of steel I can buy. Pakistani steel. Pakistani steel, yeah. French steel. And German steel. Presumably German steel is the best. Traceability is key if things go wrong. So if the information about the manufacturer and the country of origin is inaccurate, then those responsible for poor tools can't be held to account. Does it matter which one I buy for me to have the German yeah, yeah. mark? That's cool. I mean, we can, we can put any mark. You can put a stamp on Pakistan steel, French steel, German even, even, if, you, yeah. even if it's Pakistan steel, we can stick the German thing on. And would I ever have to admit that it wasn't German steel, that it was Pakistan steel? I mean, would anybody actually know the difference? No, I mean, no, nobody. I mean, it's not very easy. So, Mr. Hussein and his associate Nabil Amir are offering me lower quality Pakistani steel for use in the NHS, but they'll stamp it German. That's illegal. And from what they tell me next, it's already happening. It's very noisy. We export the, in German, like uh, French steel, but they put the German steel steel. On the French steel? Yeah. Oh, I see. So other people do that? Yep. Yeah. We wanted to ask Mr. Hussein and Mr. Amir if they had any concern for patient safety. Our repeated requests for an interview went unanswered. What the Regal London pair were offering to do was criminal. But outsourcing and the rules around the CE mark mean that even if made legally, there are no guarantees that we can trace where these kind of tools are produced anyway. The regulator, the MHRA, told us if there's evidence that devices placed on the market are not compliant, it has a range of powers and sanctions available to deal with the problem. England's Health Secretary Andrew Lansley said his department would investigate where evidence comes to light of unsafe equipment being supplied to the NHS or labour standards abuses in the supply chain. The world's surgeons rely on Sialkot for the tools of their trade. But is Britain's health sector asleep on the job? Our surgical instruments must be of the highest quality and fit for purpose. Is it time we all woke up to the risks? Next week on Panorama, why hate junk mail? It might be a menace in our mailboxes costing millions to dispose of, but without it, would our postal service survive? And just how addicted is the Royal Mail to the darker side of the letters business, scam mail? Nikki returns to work, but she's not alone. Last night's Silent Witness concludes next here on BBC One. And how pigs might just save you bacon. You're in for a surprise. Kill it, cut it, use it. Is over on BBC Three.